you read uh, both Cottrell and uh, Morris' uh, Cottrell's uh, book, and then uh, especially the Mayan prophecies, and then uh, you read Carroll's book, you become aware of the mathematics. The mathematics is very straightforward once you grasp the uh, way it now, works. Now, when you say that, excuse me, but when you say mathematics don't lie, okay, we know that. It's, it's, it's the voice of the universe. We know right. that, too. How easy is it to understand the math. Now you're a brilliant man. I mean, it's no. It's, you can leave a lot of the the confusing numbers out. What you okay. care about are the basic concepts that the the sun's equator spins faster than the poles, okay. and that this causes a distortion and a in a and a tweaking of the magnetic. Which is shown involved. in those those wonderful drawings. Okay. Yeah, and basically you needn't care about the numbers much more than the difference between the 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 twenty five day rotation and the thirty seven day rotation producing an extra lap every eighty seven days. And then if you really wanted to calculate it out down to a specific level and follow it along, Carol provides all the numbers you need and you get yourself a calculator and you find out that all of the numbers he provides in his book are extremely accurate. Hmm. And the same thing is true of Cottrell. Now here's the here's the issue. These numbers are extremely precise down to the ten thousandth part out five points beyond the decimal point. Gee. Okay, so how did the Mayans know this without these calculators? How did the Egyptians know them and so on? And the fact that they went to such a, a great degree of trouble to encode very specific numbers that have these interesting little repeating patterns mm -hmm. and cannot be mistaken for any other number, mm -hmm. uh, and they encoded them repeatedly within their systems, kept pointing back to this same uh, event. And if you eliminate the religious bent from uh, Cottrell's work and just look at what he's describing mm -hmm. and then take his interpretation off of it and continue to look at it in Garrel's fashion, you see precisely where Garrel says that these people were trying to tell us that this stuff can be calculated down to the day because it is a physical process every bit as real as the astronomy involved in predicting where the sun will arise on a specific day. Once you know the precession of the equinox, you can calculate that, oh, on the first day of spring, the sun will be here. Mm -hmm. On the first day of fall, it'll be there, etc. And, and in between, it'll rise this high. You can do it predictably and thus navigate around the planet. We've done it for hundreds of years using the sextants and so on. It's that same level of predictable math that is involved in these sunspot cycles. As long as you get away from the academic view of it all and you look at it in unschooled but very mm -hmm. educated eyes, Gerald has spent like 40 years researching his stuff. Mm -hmm. I've done probably 30 years of reading in the Vedic and the Asian traditions the same numbers without recognizing what I was seeing until I saw the code being explained to me for the Mayan component. And then it's like, well, duh, <laughs> I should have caught on to that 15 or 20 <laughs> years ago. But now that I've grasped it, it's rather startling. And basically... Sure. If we had two more bits of information, we could even predict it down to the hour. But that may not be necessary because the powers that be may be slapping us in the face with it. Well, if you look no. on the back of your your dollar bill, it says uh, Nova Order Seclorum, which does not mean New World Order. It means New Order of the Ages. And one of the predictable effects of this is that the procession gets all wonky. So we think we're going into the age of Aquarius. The sun's going to spin us around and the earth's going to spin around and heave. And all of a sudden we'll be in the age of Taurus or something based on where we end up. And we Got start it. all over again and the procession gets a little bit stranger. And all hopefully right. this time we'll get it right and come through with enough uh, of the goodies uh -huh. of civilization to get a jump on things. A lot of people are, are wondering, all right, what do we do? How do we prepare? We don't have time to build a boat. We don't live near no, the that's ocean. not true. That's not true. You've got a thousand days. You can build a boat in a thousand days. And, and then part two, those that we live in the middle of Nebraska, what, what, you know, do we build a boat there? Whatever. All right, hang on. We'll talk about the practicalities of trying to survive with maybe a pretty nasty set of circumstances, as they say, in just a couple of minutes. Okay, and we're back with Cliff High, talking about all kinds of things. Now, Cliff is partial to boats. We, since we don't know, and as we made clear, you you spelled it out. This could be fits and starts. It could. It's not going to be one huge necessarily event. It could be a lot of them on a big run up to a you know, fairly major catastrophe. Oh, yeah, you know, a lot of minor catastrophes. Could be lots of fun. Anyway, what if someone doesn't have a boat, doesn't like boats, wants to dig in? 
Can can they do that? And There's if they a, they dig in, they're going to need to dig in for how many days till the water recedes back to the the uh, the natural seabeds? Well, if they're high enough, they would be you know above that theoretically, because we don't know how. Um, we don't know how high though. Garrel no, says seven thousand feet, but that he could be wrong by four or five thousand feet. We don't know. No, actually, I think that there's some physical. There are physical limits as to how high water can actually go under ordinary circumstances. You can calculate these. You're taught them in oceanography. You can figure out how big a tsunami is going to be based on the coast and right. so on. Usually, right. the wave height is relatively a lot less than we can think about. Mm-hmm. Now, it is true that the oceans are going to want to crawl out of their beds and crawl across the, the land. However, there's Russians that have been doing a significant amount of work on this, and they say that well based on the fact that life still exists and that here's the parameters that it takes for life to exist. In other words, you can't have an atmosphere that soars up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore, you can't have continents move at this speed because they generate so much uh, heat in the form of friction that they would heat the atmosphere and everything would die. Okay, very important died. point. You, just, you went real fast on that. Please do that again slower. Okay, if, the, the, if, the, if the crust moves too fast... You ahead. get vast quantities of friction. And because the crust will shift in a particular way and the atmosphere will respond in a particular way, you'd get this huge amount of friction that would cause the atmosphere to superheat. And we know this has never happened in the past. Therefore, we can assume it never got that fast in terms of the continent spinning uh, because it, it would have wiped out all of life. And we know that that did not occur. Since we've so basically it's this, this logic that since we've survived it in the past and we know what it takes to kill humans, all of us, then we know it never happened, therefore we know it was less than that. And we've made calculations on this. For instance, uh, the Russians have done some staggering calculations and said that none of the bones of these baby mammoths that were frozen solid, almost frozen instantly, when Siberia flipped into its current position in the last of these, had none of these mammoths had bones that broke at any of the strategic spots within the leg. Huh. prior to the uh, shuddering impact. In other uh-huh. words, they weren't killed by the spinning rotation. Right. They weren't thrown to the ground and bounced around. Right. Therefore, they calculated that it could not have occurred and, and been faster than X number of meters per second, or basically couldn't have been much faster than 35 or 40 miles per hour up to a range of perhaps about 60 miles an hour relative to the mammoth standing on the ground. And so they wouldn't have really been aware of it if the whole ground had shifted at that level and the conditions would still exist that would have allowed them to have been frozen standing still without broken leg bones. So, I mean, these people have been doing work on this for... Somebody's paying them to do it, too, but they've been doing it for months and months and months because I found a huge Hmm. amount of uh, files that I was able to gradually start looking at in, in translating that goes just to this kind of an effect, just to the calculations involved. And, uh, you know, it's more than just a simple math exercise because they've done a lot of uh, strategic thinking and cross-tied and interdisciplinary mm-hmm. kind of an approach. So we know that, that we've survived in the past. We know it can't be this fast. It's likely going to occur two or three jerks um, to get a, even a huge revolution. Two of these episodes back in 21,000 B.C., apparently the Earth spun 72 degrees within the arc of the procession. So that would be spinning basically like three-quarters of the way through the year almost in terms of uh, where you start off. So it'd be kind of weird because you could start off mm. in mm. winter and it yeah, end up got it. In, in fall got it. and sort of miss the whole, uh, whole summer business, right? In any event, when that occurred, that was one of the more spectacularly damaging ones, and the Russians were able to say that, well, that one in this particular instance, you know, mm-hmm. this mountain range uh, was we know was lifted up this high, and so we can calculate the amount of force that was involved to shove this other plate underneath it. And they've done even more calculations on it and said, okay, mm-hmm. in that particular episode, we think that the level of water was about 800 meters. Well, 800 meters is still considerable, but it's not a mile and a half. That's a lot of pressure, boy. That's that's huge pressure. Yeah, but my point being that if you were up two or three thousand meters in the hills, herding sheep or whatever is, and this is the one that theoretically most of the well, Greek three thousand meters is nine thousand feet, isn't it? Uh, correct, correct. But I mean, if you were the, this was up eight hundred meters, um, you know, less than a less than a thousand meters, so less than three thousand feet. 